All right, everyone. Our homework last night was, as you know, page 63, number 12 to 16. I know that as I took a quick look at it a few minutes ago, there's some people that had a few issues with, with one or two questions. Which questions are those that we need to go over here today, please? Guessing 14. Guessing 14 is one of them. I know that a number of people asked me about 14 yesterday during scheduled help. Yep. 12. Aiden? 16? Looks like we're on a bit of a roll here. 13? And let me guess. Oh no, hand went down. So 15 is good. All right, let's take a look at 12, 13, 14, and 16. Number 12 says a coin tossed straight up into the air takes 2.75 seconds to go up and down from its initial release point, 1.3 meters above the ground. What's its maximum height? Um, I can see where the trouble can come in this question. It's a bit of a tricky question. Okay, this is a max height problem. In a max height problem, what did we say yesterday? We know one of the variables, if we read between the lines, we know one of the variables is always zero. What variable is that that's always zero if we read between the lines in a max height problem? A, V, F, V, I, um, what is it? Final velocity, good. So we're gonna say here right away, it's a max height problem, we're gonna say that VF is equal to zero meters per second. Uh, what else do we have here? We don't know what VI is, do we? It's thrown up into the air, it's tossed up into the air. Okay, it's not zero. If it's dropped from a certain height, it's zero. If it's thrown up or down, it's not zero. So we don't know what VI is. We do know the time though, right? It's 2.75 seconds, right? Anybody say something different for time? Bo? Yeah, the time is not 2.75 seconds. The time to go up and down is 2.75 seconds. If we want to find the height, the max height, we're analyzing only the trip up. And if we're analyzing only the trip up, the time that it takes this coin to go up is one half of what it takes to go up and down. So what's half of 2.75 volt? 1.3, 1.375 seconds? All right, now 1.30 is our initial position, but we're not going to use that quite yet, right? In the end, what are we really looking for? Well, let's get displacement right now, and then we'll, and then we'll go from there. Oh, look at this. The temptation here is, look, D, V, and T. Temptation is to say uh, V is equal to D over T, right? The problem with that is this is not a group A problem. It's a group B problem. It involves gravity. It involves acceleration. So we can't use that. What can we use? Well, we could say D is equal to VFT minus 1 half AT squared. Oh, wait a second. We can't use that one either, right? Because we don't know what A is. Or do we? Daniel, what's A? Yeah, it's negative 9.81. VF is 0. That crosses out negative one-half of negative 9.81 times the time squared, 1.375 squared. What do we get when we do that? So our displacement is, notice it's a negative times a negative. So our displacement becomes positive, 0 0.68977. And you got to figure, it's got to work out to be positive, right? Things going up. The coin is going up. The displacement isn't negative when the coin is going up. If we're analyzing the trip up, it's got to be a positive value. Now, it's not my final answer, but I'm real close now. If my initial position is 1.3, 1, 1 then my final position or my final height is going to be my displacement, how far I've gone up from my initial position, plus whatever my initial position was. So 1. Point, what is that? 1.98? 1.99? Yep, right? Uh, that would be wrong. 10.6 would be wrong. 
for sure. Anybody else get 1.9, 1.97, 1.98, whatever? Anybody else get the answer that was in the book? 10 points up? Yes? OK, so we've made a mistake. If, if lots of you got that, then, it, then it's probably right. Then where's our mistake here? 1.375 squared, now but one. Let's try that math again. Oh, I see what it is. When I type that into the calculator, I put 0.375 squared, not 1.375. So let's let's try that again. 0.5 times 9.81 times 1.375 squared. 9.27. Yeah, that's better. That's better. That's closer to it, right? 9.2735. Plus 1.3, that's going to give me 10 points something. Okay. The book does have several wrong answers. Um, there were literally, when this book was published um, six or seven years ago, there were thousands of them, literally thousands of mistakes. Uh, there were so many mistakes that literally we were able to use these books for one year, and then we had to send every single one of them back. And they replaced the books with brand new books because there were so many mistakes in the book. Um, they caught most of those mistakes when they when they reprinted them, but they're still they still left some. They still missed some of them. We don't run into mistakes often, but we do from time to time. That's why I was so quick on jumping on that because I'm used to seeing mistakes in that. But evidently, obviously, it was me that made the mistake this time. Okay, so ten point whatever ten point whatever that works out to be. All right, let's take a look at number 13 now. If a diver starts from rest, determine the amount of time he takes to reach the water's surface from the 10-meter platform. You ever jumped off a 10-meter platform? Diving? It's Yes? Yes? Yeah. It's high. 10 meters is high. Right. Where'd you do that at? Lindsay or at uh, Talisman Center? Do you guys do that? Do you guys dive? Okay. Um, that's the really high one, right? The big concrete platform high one. Um, you go there. I know. Uh, I've been there as well, and and uh, I've jumped off. I think it's a five. Um, but it's it's scary when you're standing up there. It's scary. It's scary because a it's it's a long distance down, but it's also scary because the pool is so calm, you can see right down to the bottom of the pool. So it looks like it's about twice as high as it really is. Um, 10 meters, 10 meter platform is so high that what they usually do actually when, when divers are practicing their dives is that they actually um, bubble air up from the bottom of the pool. I don't know if they did that when you guys were jumping or not. No? They flip a switch and, and air bubbles up from the bottom of the pool. What does that do? What's the point of that? If you fall 10 meters into water, you're moving pretty quick, right, when you hit that water. So what's the point of the top of the pool bubbling? They don't do that when you're doing competition, right, but during training, they do that. What's the point of that? Uh, the biggest part of it is to break the impact, yeah. Water has a really high, you learn this in Science 10, right, water has a really high surface tension. If you jump, you know, with your feet first or your hands first, you can break that surface tension and all is good. But if you're practicing diving and you end up, you know, kind of landing on your, you know, the wrong part, then that surface tension can be very, very high. It can literally break your back or literally break your neck. So if they bubble air up through there, you can still get hurt, but it breaks the surface tension. So there's a lot less chance of you being seriously hurt. So when you guys were jumping, I hope you were just jumping straight down and not doing crazy things if there was no uh, no, um, no bubbles coming up. All right, anyways, if this driver starts from rest, diver starts from rest, then VI is obviously going to be zero meters per second. Um, what else we got? Tell me something else here. Tell me something I don't know. OK, good. Acceleration is negative 9.81. It always is 9.81 if something is falling or rising and it's not being touched by anything else besides gravity. Yep. 
Good. Yeah, we're going to say the displacement, actually. Good. But that's, that's okay. Displacement is 10 meters, but we're actually going to call that negative 10 as well. Because if I'm defining up as positive, so that acceleration can be neg 9.81, then I need to be consistent with that and say my displacement is downward, negative 10 meters. I want to find the time here. Um, let's say d is equal to vit plus 1 half a t squared. It's easier to rearrange if I get rid of that term first. Way easier, in fact, to rearrange. Unless you're Laura, who could do the quadratic equation to solve for t. Um, let's take the half a over by dividing. Because it's multiplied by t squared. And then how do we get rid of the square? Square root it. When we square that, both sides, we get t is equal to square root of d over 1 half a. So it's say negative 10 over 1 half of negative 9.81. Let's pull this up on our calculator and see what we get. Say uh, neg 10 divided by, let's use some brackets on the bottom, 0 0.5 times neg 9.81. And now let's square root that. 1.43 seconds. Is that good? Who asked me for question number 13? Good? All right, time for number 14, my favorite question on this page. So there's a person in an apartment building is five meters above a person walking below. She plans to drop some keys to him. He is currently walking directly toward a point below her at 2.75 meters per second. How far away is he if he catches the keys 1.25 meters above the ground? Now, a number of people yesterday were asking me about this question during scheduled help. It's a tough question. There's a lot going on here. Numbers everywhere, two different people, okay? keys moving. It's confusing. We boil it down to two things. The keys are falling, and a guy is walking. Let's treat those as two separate problems. They're two separate events, right? The keys falling have nothing to do with the guy walking. The guy walking has nothing to do with the keys falling. They're not causing each other or affecting each other. So let's treat them as two separate problems. The keys problem. And let's treat it as the, the walking problem. Let's write down our givens for each of those problems, and then we'll see how we can combine them somewhere down the road here. If the keys are dropped, then the initial velocity of the keys are 0 meters per second. They will accelerate at negative 9.81 meters per second squared, if we define up as positive. Uh, and the displacement of these keys, how far do these keys fall? No, they don't fall 5 meters. Frazier? They fall 3.75. Why 3.75, Frazier? Good. Okay. The ground is 5 meters down. He's catching them 1.25 meters above the ground. So they fall 3.75 meters. And we're making that negative because A was negative. Um, that looks to be it. Let's look at the guy walking. He's walking at 2.75. That's a constant velocity of 2.75 meters per second. I think that's all we know, isn't it? Uh, looks like. We're looking for how far away he is, so we're looking for the displacement. What kind of problem do we have in the first one, the keys falling? Is that a group A or group B problem? Constant velocity or acceleration? The keys falling. Do the keys go to constant speed downwards or do they accelerate downwards? Yeah, they, they speed up as they go downwards. So we're going to say that's a group A problem. Uh, sorry, a group B problem, I should say. 
acceleration. What about the walk? The guys walking at a constant velocity. That's group. It's group A, right? So, for the first problem, we've got to use one of those acceleration equations, and for the second problem, we've got to use v equals d over t, my group A equation. Uh, what do we want to find here? Let's, let's just see if we can find an equation that will solve for something. V i a d. How about this one? This is zero. We can solve for time here. Take the one half a over by dividing t squared. Let's square root that to get rid of the squared. Let's get the time. Okay, that maybe that helps me. Maybe it doesn't, but it's something at least. It's more than we have right now. So we're going to say negative 3.75 over one half times neg 9.81. Let's square root that. Let's pull up the calculator again. Square root that. Yeah, we end up getting 0.8744. So the keys take 0.8744 seconds to fall that far. Is that helpful to me? It's not what I was looking for, but is it helpful to me? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I can, sorry, I interrupted you there, but we can take it up and use it as a given for my second problem, my walk. The guy's walking for the same time. So let's now say V is equal to delta D over delta T. Rearrange it to solve for d. The t goes up by multiplying v times t. It's 2.75 times 0 0.8744 seconds. So the guy ends up walking 2.40 meters. I want you to notice something here. It's a tough. How many people got this, by the way, first of all? Good. Good. It's a tough question. Good for you. I want you to notice that all the variables from one problem to the next, for the keys falling to the guy walking, all the variables are different, right? They're two separate problems. VI is different. A is different. Displacement are different. V, right? The displacement, the keys falling is 3.75. For the guy walking, it's 2.4. They're all different variables except for one. Which one is the same? Which variable is the same for both problems? Time, yes. Now, what's different about time versus all of these other variables there? All of the variables that you see up on the board here, these ones, these ones, they all have something in common. Time does not have that in common. Time's a scale where the rest of them are vectors. So, you got to figure, these keys falling vertically, the guy walking horizontally, because these other variables are all vectors, we can't just say the displacement is the displacement from one to the other. The displacement in the y direction will be different than the displacement in the x direction because it's a vector and direction matters. But time is a scalar. Direction doesn't matter. So the, the time value can be the same for the horizontal guy walking as the keys falling vertically. There's no reason why we can't make the time the same, even though we've got two different directions there. Because, as Bo said, it's because it's a scalar. Okay. All right, we also had uh, 16, I think, was the other one, right? This one says... A ball is dropped from a height of 60 meters. A second ball is thrown down 0 0.850 seconds later. If both balls reach the ground at the same time, what was the initial velocity of the second ball? That's a tough one as well. Okay. Nobody asked me about that yesterday, but I figure it's only because nobody got that far yesterday. 
Okay, it's a tough question. Anybody get this, by the way? We have two objects here. There's the first ball, and then there's the second one. The first ball is dropped. The second one is thrown. There's two different objects falling. That's two separate problems, just like question 14. Let's write down the given separately. Ball number one, ball number two. Ball number one has an initial velocity of zero because it's dropped. Ball number two does not have an initial velocity of zero because it's thrown downward. Now, we don't know how fast it's thrown downward, but we know that it's thrown, so we can't say vi is equal to zero. We know the displacement of ball one is negative 60 meters, if we define up as positive. Do we know the displacement of ball two? Yes. What is it? 60 meters. They both hit the ground, right? They both hit the ground at the same time. We know the acceleration of ball one is neg 9.81. And of course, the acceleration of ball two is also neg 9.81. We don't know how long it takes ball one to go down. We also don't know how long it takes ball two to go down. Uh, because that's a good question. Why is it negative 60 meters? Because we start at a height here, lands on ground level, it lands below where it started. So its displacement is has got to be a negative value because it ends up below where it started. So we don't know the time over here. We also don't know the time over here. But we do know our relationship between the two. We're going to say if delta t2 is the time that it takes for object number two to fall, then delta t1 is going to be delta t2 plus 0 0.850 seconds. Or we could have said it delta t2 is delta t1 minus 0 0.850 seconds. That makes sense? That's not ideal, but it's better than nothing. Write down the relationship. Okay, it's better than not writing down anything at all. And we want to find, of course, vi for object number two. So, what are we going to do here? Well, let's try this. I don't know, honestly, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but let's give this a try. Let's try setting the two displacements equal to each other. Displacement 1 equal to displacement 2. Are they equal to each other? They're both neg 60 meters, so I have done nothing wrong. Now, is it going to help me? I'm not sure, but I've done nothing wrong for sure. What equation could describe displacement? Well, how about VIT plus 1 half ET squared? Now remember that this is all object number 1, right? <coughs> and object number 2, we describe it by the same equation. But it's going to have a subscript of a 2 there. So the displacement of ball 1 is equal to the displacement of ball 2. Vi 1, delta t 1, so on. Now, this is 0 because Vi is 0 for object number 1. Okay, let's just go with this and see what happens, okay? Delta t 1 is delta t 2 plus 0 0.850 seconds squared. That looks ugly. You guys learned the FOIL method? Math class? First, outside, inside, last? There's good news. I don't think we're going to have to do that. But I mean, that's the first thought that comes to your mind when you see that, though, right? Something plus something squared. VI2, uh, that's what we're looking for. 
delta T2. Hmm. I don't know if this is going to work for us. We have two unknowns there, right? We've got delta T, and we've got uh, VI. We might have to try something else. Travis? Yeah, you know what? Actually, that is, that's, that is the best way to do it, yeah. Um, Travis, that's a, really good, that's a really good point. You know what, though? I'm glad I started this way. I mean, clearly, what I'm doing on the board here is, when Travis uh, suggests the way there, is harder than it has to be. I'm glad I did that, because it illustrates something. Okay. When you do something that's valid, when you use an equation that's valid, when you don't go using a wrong equation like V equals D over T or something like that, you don't have to worry. You don't have to panic about, oh, I'm gonna, this is going to give you the wrong answer. No, it won't. What happened to me when I started doing something that, that wasn't going to work? We got to this point and said, I got two unknowns. It's not going to work. Did I get the wrong answer? I know to stop and I know to try something else, right? Okay, so don't ever worry about that. Try something. If it doesn't work for you, then try something else. But you won't get the wrong answer as long as you're trying something that's valid. Really? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's essentially what Travis was suggesting, which is easily the way to do it. Yeah, it's by far a better way than I was, for whatever reason, I'm not sure why I was thinking that, but in the end, in the end, uh, it, still, it still illustrates that point where, you know, we can make that mistake as long as we're not messing up with equations, and it's not going to give us the wrong answer. It's just going to tell us we've got to try something else, like you guys are suggesting here. Okay, so let's get that time here. Let's get that time for object number one here. Uh, let's say D is equal to VIT plus one half AT squared. Um, let's rearrange it. We can get rid of that. Let's rearrange it to solve for T here. D over one half A. We've done this a few times already today, right? Rearrange it to solve for T. Neg 60 meters divided by one half of neg 9.81. What do you get for the time there, Billy? Yeah, do you have that? A uh, question, uh, if you didn't hear it, was how can we cross off the VIT if we don't know what T is? Anybody have an answer for that? Casty? Yeah, VI is zero. 0 times 2 is 0. 0 times 8 is 0. 0 times 16,000 is 0. So it doesn't matter what t is. It still, dis it still disappears from the equation. All right, let's, uh, let's see what we get here. Okay, let's say neg 60 divided by some brackets here, 0.5 times neg 9.81. Let's square root that. 3.4975. If that's 3.4975, then T2 has got to be 3.4975 minus 0 0.850 seconds, because we know that T1 is 8.850 seconds more. That's going to give me a time of... Two point six four seven five. Well, now that we have that, this question is not so bad, right? Solving for vi, it's a little bit tricky to rearrange. Take the one half at squared over by subtracting. And then we got to get rid of the t. How do we do that? Multiplied by VI, get rid of it by, yes. All 
All right, when we plug our numbers into there, that should give us our answer for VI. Okay, what do we get here? What do we get here? D was neg 60. Subtract, let's use some brackets here, 0 0.5 times neg 9.81 times 2.6475 squared. Let's end those brackets. Let's press equals. That's my numerator. That's what's on top. We divide that by t again, 2.6475, and we get 9.67, negative 9.67. We knew that it should be a negative, right? Because it was thrown downwards, not thrown upwards. I'm glad we did that question. I'm glad that my mind was leading me on a little bit of a wild goose chase with that method that I tried first. Okay. I'm glad that you can see that even when that happens, okay, and it will happen to you sometimes, that you don't need to worry that the worst that's going to happen is you're not going to get an answer because you've got too many unknowns. You're not going to get the wrong answer. Okay. The reason that I'm able to solve any problem in Physics 20 or Physics 30, besides the fact that I've gone through the course so many times, which helps, obviously, the real reason that I'm able to solve any of those problems, the reason I'm able to get 100 on a tough diploma exam in Physics 30, is not because I'm smart. Okay, some of you guys, okay, once you're my age and have had the schooling that I've had, are going to be just as smart as I am, or smarter. The reason that I'm able to do that is because I'm not afraid of these things. Okay, I see a question that I'm not sure what to do right away, and I don't worry about that. I don't panic. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I'm not going to get. This. I'm going to get this wrong. I don't know what to do. I try stuff. Okay, I try stuff, and if it doesn't work, I try something else. And if that doesn't work, I try something else. And sooner or later, what happens? I get the answer. Always. Okay, so that's the mindset that you've got to be in as well. Don't be afraid to try things. Just make sure that it's valid things, valid equations. It's going to work out. Yesterday, we started looking at adding vectors together in two dimensions. We call those non-collinear vectors, where we're adding them together in two dimensions, versus one dimension, collinear vectors. We learned in grade one how to add scalars. 3 plus 4 was equal to 7. We learned at some point later on, I'm not sure what grade, how to add vectors, although your teacher might not have said it was adding vectors. In the end, that's what it really was. 3 plus negative 4 is equal to negative 1. We only learned yesterday how to add vectors that are in two dimensions, an in east and a north, or a south and a west, as opposed to all on one plane, north, south, or east, west. How do we do that? Well, the first thing we need to be able to do is draw a vector diagram. And to draw a vector diagram, we need to be able to draw a vector. A vector is a line segment with an arrow on the end of it. It's as simple as that. Don't put the arrow in the middle. Okay, don't do this. A vector is a line segment with an arrow on the end of it. Now, a vector diagram will always have more than one vector. It'll have two or three or four or five vectors. This vector diagram will help us to find the sum of all of the vectors. It'll help us to add vectors together that aren't in one dimension. The rule for drawing these vector diagrams is that the vectors always have to be drawn front to back. This is the front of a vector. This is the back of a vector. So if I have this vector that I want to add to this vector, I have to make sure that the front of this vector is at the back of this one, or the front of this one is at the back of this one. doesn't really matter which way you go. OK, we could draw it front to back, or we can draw it front to back. Either way is OK, as long as they're drawn front to back. The resultant vector, the vector that gives us the sum of all the vectors, 
When we say 3 plus 4 is equal to 7, the sum of 3 plus 4 is 7. Okay, the result of 3 plus 4 is 7. The resultant vector, the sum of these vectors, is going to be a line that joins the start to the finish. It's drawn backwards. Instead of being drawn from front to back, it's drawn from back to front. We can draw right here, or we can draw right here, and you can see that that resultant vector, that sum, is going to be the exact same vector either way. So you can solve these problems either way. Now, what do you do when you have that vector diagram drawn? You got a nice, relatively simple right angle triangle here. What are we going to do with that to find that green line? Find the value, I should say, of that green line. No? Nobody knows? Okay, we'll, we'll deal with that in a minute. Then. Okay, don't, don't panic about that right now. Okay, I just thought, I thought somebody might know the answer to that, but we'll deal with it in just a minute, okay? We okay with drawing those? Yes? Let's say the first one, that's not drawn to scale very well, but let's say that the first one is 3 and the second one is 4. How are we going to find that green one? Well, we know that if this is a right angle triangle, then this is the hypotenuse. And the hypotenuse can be found by using the Pythagorean theorem. a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. The hypotenuse in this case, we're going to call the resultant vector r. r, r squared is equal to 3 squared plus 4 squared, or r is equal to the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared. r is equal to 5. We found the value of that resultant vector by just using the Pythagorean theorem. Does that make sense? Now, what would happen if we did it over here? 4 and 3, let's say r is equal to the square root of 4 squared plus 3 squared. What do we end up getting? r is equal to? right? I told you just a minute ago, it doesn't matter which way you draw it. If you add 3 plus 4, what do you get? If you add 3 plus 4 scalars, what do you get? 3 plus 4 is equal to 7, right? If you add 4 plus 3, what do you get? 7. It doesn't matter what order you add them in. It doesn't matter what order we add these in, as long as you draw the vector diagram front to back. All right. Now, we do need to get a direction as well. The angle is always drawn at the start of the vector diagram. Why do we need an angle, by the way? If we're adding vectors together, then we should get a vector for a final answer. A resultant, the sum of those vectors, should be a vector. A vector has both magnitude and direction. We need a direction. 5 isn't good enough. We need a direction. So let's find a direction. You guys familiar with sine, cos, and tan? Yeah, you've used them a million times, right? Do you remember them? Just a little aside here over here, guys. If you remember, cosine theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. Sine theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. And tan theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. This is my angle. This is opposite to the angle. This is adjacent. I know my opposite and adjacent side. Therefore, I'm going to use tan. But I'm not solving for one of those sides. I'm solving for theta. So I'm going to take my tan equation. And I've got to rearrange it to solve for theta. Theta is going to be the second function, tan, of opposite over adjacent. So now let's pull that up on the calculator. We're going to, to solve that, we're going to first make sure our calculator is in degree mode. Yep, yep. 
And then we're going to say second function tan of opposite over adjacent gives us 53 degrees. If we do the same thing over here, we're going to get the inverse tan of opposite over adjacent, 3 over 4. That's going to give me on my calculator 37 degrees. How can that be? Well, they're both right. Okay, they're both right. If I'm standing in the middle of the room right now, then Olivia might say that I'm two meters behind her. Daniel might say that I'm two meters in front of him, right? Who's right? We're both right. Okay, you're both absolutely right. So we can express a direction different depending upon our frame of reference. All we have with these two diagrams are two different frames of reference. This one is 53 degrees from the horizontal axis. This one is 37 degrees from the vertical axis. They're both right. It's just two different frames of reference. I'll give you a way of describing those frames of reference soon. All right? You guys feel okay with this? What are we going to do if we have more than two vectors? What if we have three, or four, or seven? or 30. We can't draw a right angle triangle when we have 30 vectors. It just doesn't work. You gotta have three sides, not 31 sides. So what we have to do is take vector components of each of those. And I'll explain what that means in a second when we see the example. Take vector components. For instance, if we want to add these vectors together, 25 to the north, 20 to the east, and 30 to the north. And then we're going to take components so that we get an x and a y. Let's make a little chart over here. My x. All right. I've got 25 meters. Uh, sorry. The x part of 25 meters to the north is nothing. Right? None of that is None of that is x. None of that is horizontal. It's all vertical, right? 20 meters is all horizontal. And none of the last one is horizontal. We add those up, and we get a total x component, a total east-west component of 20. For the y's, well, the first one is 25. The second one is what? for the y component. East and west are x, north, south are y. How much of that 20 is north, south? How much of that 20 is y component? Sorry? None. How much of the 30 is? All of it, right? Let's add those up. So the total x is 20, the total y is 55. Now, Let's pretend the question didn't say add 25 and 20 and 30. Let's pretend the question said add 20 and 55. Now, that may seem somewhat obvious at this point to you. And it may seem like you don't even need to go through the process that we just went through. You could have done that in your head, right? As problems get tougher and we start dealing with angles other than 90 degrees, it becomes critical to use this structure. So I'm asking you, even when you get straightforward questions like this, where you could do in your head, to follow the method that I'm following there. Add up the x of each one. Add up the y of each one. Then, pretend you were just asked to add 20 and 55. 20 meters to the east, 55 to the north. Solve for the resultant vector. We know how to do this, right? R is equal to 20 squared plus 55 squared. Square root it. Square 
square root of uh, 20 squared plus 55 squared gives me 58.5, 58 meters. I'm not done, though. I've got to find an angle. The angle is drawn at the start. It's always going to be found using the inverse tan function of opposite over adjacent. This one is going to work out to be, let's see here, the inverse tan, second function tan, 55 over 20 equals 70 degrees. What else could it have been? Well, if I had to draw it like this, anybody want to take a stab at what my angle would have been? 20. It would have been 20 if I had done that. Both would have been correct, right? I was two meters behind Olivia. I was two meters in front of Daniel. It's just two different frames of reference. Okay? That, that's not crazy hard, is it? The only difference here is this step right here, where we had to get the 20 and the 55. Once we get the 20 and the 55, it was just like the questions we did yesterday. Try that one, please. There's four vectors there. But of course, we're going to use the same basic analysis. Instead of having three numbers that we're adding up, we're going to have four numbers that we're adding up. That's all. Can you see what we can do with that? And then we'll take a look at it as a class in a couple minutes here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you've had a chance to work on it. Let's see what we can do here as a class here now. Uh, we've got to do our x and y components, right? x and y. x, remember, <coughs> excuse me. X, remember, is this way. Y is this way. Okay? X is east-west for now. Y is north-south. We've got four vectors here. How much of that 10 meters is east-west? How much of that 10 meters is on the x-axis? All of it. All of it is. Right? All of it. How much of that 15 meters is on the x-axis? None. None of it. The 12 meters? All of it is. But we're going to make it negative because it's to the west. Fourth one? None. We add those up, we get negative 2 meters. The y components, we're going to say that none of the 10 meters is y component. All of the 15 meters is y component because it's south, but because it's south, we're going to make it, Josh, negative. Yeah. The 12 meters, it's all, it's all uh, east-west, right? So it's all the x component. The 20 meters is also y component, and it's also going to be negative because it's south. Add those together, we get negative 35 meters. All right. Now I'll pretend the question didn't ask me to add these four different vectors. Now I'll pretend the, the question asked me to add these two vectors, 2 and 35. We've got 2 to the west, 2 on the x-axis to the left. We've got 35 on the y-axis to the south, front to back. And then we've got our resultant vector that's drawn from back to front, from start to finish. R is going to be equal to the square root of 2 squared plus 35 squared. And theta, drawn up here at the start, the beginning of the vector diagram, is where tail and tail, or our back and back of the vectors, meet up with each other. Theta is going to be the inverse tan function of opposite over adjacent. What do we get for R there? Somebody's got to have that. Fraser, what did you get? I heard you, heard you giving an answer before. Um, not 35, that's 35 squared plus 2 squared square root. Uh, 35.057. 35.057, so it ends up being 35 meters, right? We'll round it to two digits. Okay. 
Well, yeah, technically you're supposed to keep it until you have a final answer. But we're not going to use that number again. That is essentially a final answer for V already, for R already. What's the angle? We're good to be 80-something, you said, I think? 81. 87. 87. Anybody draw it differently? Anybody draw it like this? Yes? And what would you get for an angle? Three? And same thing. I'm two meters behind Olivia. I'm two meters in front of Daniel. Two different frames of reference, right? Same thing, though. Good? Okay. Yeah, Travis? That's right. No, I always get the angle at the start. No. Um, we're going two to the left, 35 down. So on the first diagram, I went two to the left first, and then 35 down. Here I went 35 down, and then two to the left. The start is still up here. Does that make sense? So that works out to be three degrees. Had you calculated that angle, you would have gotten 87, actually, which wouldn't have been right, actually. In this context, that would have been a wrong answer. Okay. All right. I'm going to give you two more examples to work on, and then that's it for the day, OK? Here's the first one, your second one. That's it. So work on those two questions either now during scheduled help or tonight for homework, and we'll check them over tomorrow, okay?